today's New Testament reading is Ephesians 3, verses 14 to 21. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that, according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length of height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Today's Gospel reading is Mark 16, verses 1 through 8. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome bought spices, so that they may go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Please join me in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for this great day of celebration celebration of your power to redeem your world, to redeem your children, to redeem and renew our relationships with you and with each other. We thank you for the joy of having Pastor Terry here celebrating with us. Thank you for being with her during her time away from us and for the promise of being with her and and with us as we move forward into whatever is next. Bless her today as she hears and shares your message and continue to guide her in the days ahead. We pray in the name of your risen Son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you. This is my 39th year preaching Easter Sunday. Some of you are not even anywhere near 39 years old. Some of you have lapped it a couple times, but that's all right, too. And this is probably the last time I'll preach on Easter Sunday because usually people don't invite guest preachers on Easter Sunday. But this is probably the second or third time I've preached from Mark's Gospel because nobody likes Mark's Easter story. Why do you think that is? Anybody pay any attention to it? The end. Let me read you the end again. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. That's not the story we like, is it? We like the one where they run out and they tell everybody in the world. Well, Mark's gospel is an interesting one. And, you know, they say, tell the disciples and Peter, a little zing to him, because Peter did what? Denied knowing him. So Peter is not even a disciple, the disciples and Peter, that had to hurt. But then, excuse me a minute. But the women don't even tell. This has always been my go-to passage when someone says to me, God does not call women. Which usually I can just say thank you for your sharing that with me. But um, Sometimes people will say that to me in different places. Once it was at a wedding reception where I was sitting next to a man who said, you know you're not going to go to heaven, right? I said, excuse me? I had just done the wedding, and 
There's always a crazy table at a wedding reception. Did you know that? There's the crazy table. You've all, anybody who's made a seating chart knows you put people at the crazy table who are crazy. And you put the pastor there because the pastor can handle crazy. So what this guy said to me was, you know, you're not going to heaven, right? I said, excuse me? He said, now women, women are sanctified through their husbands and you're single. And besides that, you take authority over men and you teach them so you're not going to heaven, right? Well, at first I just sat there cutting my baked potato, picturing his head. And I thought, no, God, forgive me for that one. So what I said to him and said was, you know, when Jesus came out of the tomb, he appeared to women. They believed him. They told. That's a mandate to preach. And he didn't say anything to that one. But you can't say that here, can you? Because the women went home and locked themselves up in the room. And Peter, and Peter, wow. But you know, this is not the, the, this is the traditional end of Mark's gospel. Mark, the shortest gospel, only 16 chapters. Mark does not care about Jesus being born, doesn't care about Bethlehem and the angels and all that. Where does Mark's gospel begin? The baptism of Jesus. It's the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ. And the word you hear most often in Mark is immediately. Immediately he did this, immediately he did that. So here we are this morning reading Mark. Mark literally ends in the middle of a sentence, the original text, which is what we read today. Chapter 16 is only eight verses long. But through the years, they've tried to add other endings to it, and I'm talking in antiquity, not, not modern scholarship. But here's the long ending. Now, after he arose on the first day of the week, he appeared to Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons. She went out and told those who had been with him while they were mourning and weeping. So it's good. She's telling somebody, right? But when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they would not believe it. Again. After this, he appeared in another form to two of them as they were walking into the country. He went back and told the rest, but they did not believe them. Not again. Later, he appeared to the eleven themselves as they were sitting at the table, and he upbraided them for their lack of faith and stubbornness, because they had not believed those who saw him after he was risen. Not a lot to get excited about in Mark's gospel, is there? Except it didn't stop there, did it? We know that they told somebody. Why do we know that? Why do we know that they eventually got over their fear and they told somebody? How do we know that? We're here this morning, people. Somebody found their voice at some point. Somebody found their courage and they started to tell the story and they told someone, they told someone, they told someone, they told someone, until they finally told the person who told you. Stop for a minute. I want you to call out the name of whoever first told you the good news of Jesus Christ, that he was raised for you, that he loves you. Who was it? Maybe it was mom. It was my mother who told me. Yell out names. Come on, I want names. Somebody told you the good news, and somebody's depending on you to tell them the good news, or we're going to have an empty church, or empty churches around the building, around the world, I mean. Baltimore Archdiocese of the Catholic Church is closing 61 of its congregations this year. 61. Somebody's not telling the good news, and that's just, that's just the Catholic brothers and sisters. That's the counter-Protestant brothers and sisters. Hmm. But it's time for a little radical emergence, I think, don't you? The radical is that first root that comes through the seed, and it goes into the ground where it drinks water, and it firmly plants itself, and then the flower grows. We're called to radical emergence, aren't we? To come out of our shells, as I said to the kids. Whether you're a chicken or a butterfly, you've got to come out of your shell. It's time to come out of your cocoon. Literally, time to come out of the tomb and tell someone about the good news of Jesus Christ. I'm losing my voice. I can't tell that much longer with my words, anyway, my preaching. But I will tell people as long as I'm able. And what we need to do is learn how to be radicals in that other sense of the word. Um, back in the 80s, when I was a pastor, a young pastor, I was invited to preach the Seven Last Words Good Friday service. You familiar with those in the olden days where you'd go for three hours between noon and three o'clock, the time Jesus hung on the cross, and the seven last words from the cross, they'd have seven preachers preach. I was amazed the Southern Baptist Church in Pasadena, Maryland, called me up at the Magathy Church of the Deaf and said, we'd like you to preach on Good Friday. I was amazed at their openness to women in the ministry, and this was in the 80s when Methodists didn't even want women in the ministry. I hate to break to you, but there are people in 2024 who don't want women in the ministry. But 
I said yes, and I showed up with my little vestments over my arm, and I went into the office, and I said to the secretary, where are the pastors gathering? And she said, they're in the pastor's study, but you're not allowed there. I said, why not? She said, you're a woman. I said, I'm one of the preachers. She said, oh, no, you are not. I took out my letter, shaking, and said, here it is, the invitation that I got. She said, stay there. The pastor came out and looked at me and went, oh, we thought we had invited Terry, the male Presbyterian from Severna Park, not Terry, the female Methodist from Pasadena. He said, we never had a woman preach in this church before. This is a Baptist church. We don't acknowledge women pastors. I said, then I'll leave. And he said, we can't have six words, can we? I said, it's up to you. And he said, you're going to have to preach. Oy vey. <laughs> they had to lower the pulpit for me. It was a very modern sanctuary with the pulpit that raised up. And then it came up to here on me. All the other preachers were like seven, eight feet tall that day, it seems. I followed Father Bourbon, literally his name was Father Bourbon, who stood up and said, you all have disrespected the mother of our Lord and walked out the aisle and people were looking at him like, wow. And then I stood up and was like, oh wow, oh wow. We're going from the frying pan into the fire here now, the fires of hell apparently, because I stood up to preach and people stood up and stomped out and coughed and dropped hymnals on the floor. And I felt a little sick to my stomach, but I preached. What was I preaching? I was preaching about being a radical. Oh. I was using the mathematical radical, which is the intersection of three circles, and talking about how the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all united at the cross. There's someone on the front pew who made faces at me the whole time, like, <laughs> Then I said something, and she started crying. I thought, wow, I really hurt her now, didn't I? She came up to me at the end of the sermon and said, I don't know if you knew, to, knew this or not, if you noticed, but I was trying to make you feel uncomfortable. I said, yeah, I sort of got that feeling. She looked like my cat when I had a hairball trying to claw it up. <laughs> she started crying because she said, my husband calls me a radical sometimes and says it's a bad thing. And she said, you're talking about being a radical, going out into the world as, as the disciple of Jesus Christ and sharing Christ and being the presence of Christ in the world. She said, you humbled me and you changed my mind. I think women can preach now. I said, probably don't tell your pastor that. She said, oh, I can't tell him that. At the end of the service, he handed me and he said, sister, you're welcome to preach here anytime you want. I said, thank you. I was never invited again in the six years I lived there, but it was a nice sentiment to hear. Jesus came out of the tomb as a radical emergence, but not the radical like the root that goes into the ground, but he came out as a radical with an AL, which is what we're called to be in the name of Christ. We're called to be radicals. We're called to be the place where the intersection of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit come together in his community of faith. Because what it means to be a radical is relating to or affecting the fundamental nature of something that has far-reaching or thorough consequences. Think about that a moment. Being a radical with an AL is relating to or affecting the fundamental nature of something that is far-reaching or thorough. There's nothing more far-reaching than the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead because we're here 2,000 years later celebrating that this morning. We're up and dressed and looking pretty good. You all look really good when you get up and get dressed and get in church. But these are the synonyms for the... Um, word radical is an adjective, extreme, fanatical, rabid, revolutionary, ultra, or as a noun, if you're a radical, you're crazy, or an extremist, or revolutionary. It's not a bad thing to be, really, if you think about it, in the name of Christ our Savior. Now, I picked the Ephesians passage this morning. I always read the gospel, and this was the gospel, this was the year of Mark. I, I thought I'm going to go with Mark this morning. But I picked Ephesians to go with it. This is a passage I've picked out for my funeral. I picked it years ago. So don't think it's anything that's going to happen to me. I hope soon. I don't hope soon. You know what I mean. But listen to these words again. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes his name. I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his spirit and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. If your seed is going to take root, it's got to be rooted and grounded in something. Let it be in love. Let it be in love for other people. Let it be in love for people who are different from you, who don't look like you, 
who don't talk like you. We've got a lot going on in this country right now where we're being told these other people are others to us. You gotta look at everybody you see and see the image of God in that person's face, no matter what that person's face looks like, because that is who we're called to be in Jesus Christ, our Savior. We're called to be radicals in our loving of others, our acceptance of others. Amen? You gotta live that way, folks. And then I love this part. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and depth and height and length and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with the fullness of God. God loves us beyond our ability to comprehend. We can't know how wide God's love is, how broad, how deep, how eternal God's love is for us in Jesus Christ. But until we learn that, we're going to start looking at each other like, what is wrong with her, what is wrong with him? You're radical, you're crazy, you're this, you're that, you're the other. We've got to look at everyone and see Christ in each person we meet. So each of us bears the image of our God. But the ending is what gets me. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly more than we can ask or imagine, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. And I bet you have a pretty good imagination. I can imagine a world where Republicans and Democrats work together for the good of the people. I can imagine that, can you? I can imagine a world where people of different races and ethnicities sit at the same table and share Christ with one another. Can you imagine that? I can imagine a world where love is the strongest power that there is, more than any power that's been trying to divide us, that the power that brings us together, the power of Christ is stronger than anything else in all creation. Can you imagine that with me? I got a better imagination. Before moving back to Cockeysville, because I am a Cockeysvillian, I am a member of the original Delaney High School Marching Band, which is celebrating our 50th, 50th anniversary this year. It's amazing, I was in the band before I was born, apparently. But I'm from Cocky, so I spent my last 23 years in West Virginia. Where I met Miss June Poisel, who is the, one of the best people I've ever known in my life. Miss June died in her 90s. She was four foot seven inches tall. And her fighting weight soaking wet was 72 pounds when she died. She had come down from 78 pounds when she was healthier. Miss June was the principal of Hedgesville School when it was a 12 year school. Later, she became principal of the elementary school. Before that, she started teaching in Berkeley County in 1936 in a one-room schoolhouse in Jarrettstown, where my home was. I didn't know until she came to see me once, and you had to bring her down to see it because she didn't drive anywhere. She couldn't see her with a steering wheel. But she said, oh, there's my old school. I said, what do you mean your old school? She said, I used to teach there. That's where I started my career, 1936. The day she died, the back fell out of the building. It was a one-room school. They had an outhouse that had fallen down years before, but the back fell out of the building that day, and I thought, that is appropriate. She told me about her early days teaching. She was a crazy woman. She worked, she was a volunteer with Meals on Wheels, and she would call up, and people would say, when Miss June calls, grown men tremble. She would call, and she'd say, not, could you possibly drive Meals on Wheels this Thursday? She'd say, I need you Thursday. You're driving Meals on Wheels, all right? And they'd say, yes, ma'am. She had such authority, and she was such a loving, Christ-centered human being. But, oh, she said, yep, when I started teaching, she said, these boys put a snake in my desk one day. He said, oh, Miss Poison, look in your desk. we got a surprise for you. She said, I opened it up, and there's this black snake all curled up. She said, it had just eaten a mouse. So I took it out, cut it in half, and squeezed the mouse. And I said, we're going to have a science lesson. She said, nobody ever messed with me again. She also, when she was a principal, said she said to me one day, I probably get in trouble for doing this now. But she had a boy who was truant all the time, and she called his mother and said, he just doesn't want to come to school. He goes under the bed in the morning. She got in her car, drove her, pulled him out by the ankles, put him in her car, and drove him to school. She said, I'll be back tomorrow if you're not there, and he was there the next day. It's a tough lady. Do you know what I noticed at the school? Even though the wall fell down and then the other walls fell in, there were flowers that came up every spring, tulips and daffodils. There were irises that came up every year because in 1936, she and her class had planted a couple of bulbs. And they spread. 
They went down the road and down the hill and they were everywhere. There were hundreds of flowers from those bulbs she planted in 1936 with her kids. That's gotta be a lesson to us. We've got to plant the gospel of Jesus Christ in the hearts of people. We gotta tell people that Christ loved us, Christ loves them, and Christ loves the world enough to give himself for our sake. That is what's gonna change the world, folks. So we gotta imagine that kind of world and then we will have the kind of world that Christ imagined that he died to create. It's my last Easter preaching, but I'm not gonna stop until I'm with Jesus full time, telling people about the love of God. I'm here because somebody loved me enough to tell me. Somebody loved me enough to tell me. Somebody loved you enough to tell you. Who do you love enough to tell? Who do you love enough to tell that Christ is their savior? Not in a judgmental way, but in a way that invites them to new life. It means sharing your vulnerability, it means coming out of your shell. But if you do, you will emerge radically into this world. Like those disciples, they finally got over their fear. I'm grateful to God that they did or I would not be here today. We wouldn't be here today, we wouldn't be here today. But who do you love enough to tell the good news of Jesus Christ? Christ is risen indeed. What do you say? Amen. Amen, amen, amen.